If you have your Bibles, open them up to Psalm 51. And as you guys are finding your way to Psalm 51, let's pray and ask for the Lord's anointing as always on the teaching of his word. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And we're humbled to have your word, to be able to read it, to be able to hear it, Lord, to be able to absorb it. And Lord, what a powerful Psalm. All the Psalms, Lord, are life changing in different ways. But Lord, Psalm 51, again, one of the most powerful Psalms of encouragement and uh, restoration and healing. And no doubt there are many of us here tonight that need to hear this word. And God, just help us to receive it. Uh, I pray you would do a, a deep and special work tonight through the Psalms, and especially here in Psalm 51. Um, Lord, just changing lives and restoring your people who need to be restored tonight. God, just thank you for your faithfulness to do it. We ask now that you would just again, um, Lord, speak to us what you want us to hear. And, and we're all ears, Lord. We want to hear what you have to say to us tonight and what the Spirit is saying to the church. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 51 is one of the greatest psalms in all the Bible. Now, there are so many psalms that are great in the Bible. I mean, they all are. It's God's word. But there are certain ones that stand out. We think of Psalm 22 that talks about the crucifixion of the Lord prophetically. We think of Psalm 23, which most everybody knows. Uh, if you've ever been to a funeral, that's so common at funerals. And, um, and just psalms that really stand out in a special way. Well, Psalm 51 is one of those psalms that stands out in a special way. And the reason being is this is a psalm that David wrote after his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. And again, it was a psalm that came out of great brokenness. As a matter of fact, if I could sum this psalm up, it would be a psalm of brokenness. And I, I can say from a personal standpoint, the greatest work that God does in our lives oftentimes is in those moments of brokenness. And there's nothing like the total collapse of ourself. You know, we hate it and we hate the way it feels, but there's nothing like it when it comes to what God can do in, deep into our heart with that. I had someone just today talking to me about someone that they love and someone they know that's going through a very dark time and they were, you know, trying to find ways to how they would escape that dark time. And, and I told them, certainly you want to be freed from that dark time. You want to have the light of God. You want to be on the mountaintop. But I said, don't despise the dark times. Don't despise depression. But Pastor Mark, I need to get out of depression. Maybe you need to go get a pill or something, whatever. Don't despise depression. It's a gift of God. It's not a fun gift. But oftentimes when God brings depression and heaviness, it's not something that we should run from. And how do I escape it? It's something we should press into and say, Lord, what is it you're doing? And what do you want to do in me? I'm not talking about someone in danger of suicidal thoughts and things like that. You need to seek help if you're having those kind of things. You don't want to allow the enemy or your own um, weaknesses and our own weaknesses, we're, we're frail, you know, to get us in a place where we can harm ourselves. That's not what I'm talking about. But don't be so quick to run from sadness and sorrow and depression and, and even think you need to run to a doctor. You look in the Psalms, David ran to God. And he said, God, what is it that you're doing in me? What is it you want to do? And David had some of the darkest times in his life, and David had some of the greatest times in his life that he shared with us from the Psalms. And this one is really a mixture of both. This came out of one of the darkest times of David's life. And then it led to some of the greatest restoration. And some of the deepest, really most heartfelt Psalms that David wrote was after his sin with Bathsheba and, and Uriah. I'm not advocating some deep sin in order to make us deeper in the Lord. I'm simply saying that sometimes our deepest, darkest moments, whether it's sin or some other issue that causes them, God goes deep within us and makes changes that I wouldn't go back and trade for anything. I hated it going through it, but I wouldn't go change it because some of the greatest changes God made in me as a man in becoming more like the Lord, and, and of course, we all have so far to go on that, but if you want to see tangible changes, they came during dark times. This really is reflected in Psalm 51, and it's summed up in brokenness. So if you're here tonight and you're experiencing brokenness, this psalm is for you. And God is going to do, I think, a deep work in your heart through this psalm if you allow him to. And, and some of the rich things that, that David wrote, that God put in David's heart, and really the Holy Spirit wrote through David, quite obviously, when he did this, uh, are just astounding. Now, again, you look at David, and we, we, we talk about this a lot, a man after God's own heart. Even the introduction to this psalm, before he gets, gets into it, shows us why David was a man after God's own heart. Look what it says. 
to the chief musician a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Now you have to understand the setting of this to realize why that is such a profound intro. Why is that so profound? Imagine falling in some horrible sin that the whole church found out about. And everybody knew it. And it's hard enough for you to come to church because you feel like when you're sitting down, everybody's looking at you. And they're watching you going, you know, this, you just kind of feel eyes on you because they know you did that horrible thing, all right? This is David. Now imagine writing a song for the worship team and saying, now, I want you to give this to the worship team and I'm titling it, this is when Mark did that horrible, terrible sin that embarrassed him and humiliated him in front of everyone. It's, it's dedicated to that. I want y'all to sing it to the whole church. Mark is horrible, God is good. He's so evil and wicked, but God is wonderful and free. Who wants to have people singing that? I mean, it, it would be so hard to be there. David, when he wrote this, he would have been in the congregation singing about his failure with everyone else. You know, sometimes you stand in church and you raise your hands. Is somebody looking at me because I'm raising my hands? You know, should I clap? Should I not clap? What should I do? You know, I don't know. What we, different people think different things. Couldn't you imagine going, okay, we're all singing about my sin and humiliation right now together. Is anybody, and you look around to see if anybody's looking at you. You know, all I do is sometimes mention the girls as an example. I'll say the girls, you know, and everybody turns and looks at them. And I, and I oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but it's just something about our human nature. This is David. He writes this. He goes, Here, here's the, the theme of all this is when I did this horrible sin against God and when Nathan came and publicly rebuked me. Now you know why David was a man after God's own heart. Because although David did some horrific sins. I, I, I don't think many of you in here have killed anyone. Now, maybe you have. There may be somebody that actually killed someone. That's possible. But I doubt very few of you have, if any. Uh, maybe some have committed adultery. Probably not that many. I don't know. But you haven't done anything any worse than David did, is my point. I'm not justifying our sin. I'm saying David is gonna show through this. He was completely forgiven and washed clean by God and was so broken and so humble about it, he just confessed it. Now, I don't think we need to go pronouncing our sins everywhere so that you know, people can talk about us and gossip and all that. That's not my point. David wasn't doing that. But what David is showing is David was the personality and David had the heart after God that once he was convicted and once he repented, he was all in. It was full throttle. I am wicked. I am evil. I confess. God, forgive me what needs to be done to make this right. And so you have to love David's heart. You might think, I could never do that. Well, David did, and he did it more than once when you read the Psalms, and now you know why God looked at David and said, you know what, David, you messed up really horribly, but look at your heart and your desire to repent. How can I turn you away? You're a man after my own heart, David. Not because of your sin, that was horrible, but because of how you're repenting. And so as we go through this tonight, if you have some of these sins or some other sin hanging over you, be very open and broken about it with God, and God has mercy for you tonight. He has grace. He has forgiveness. So we're going to see that the cleansing that David talks about is deep and rich, and it is complete. How many of you have done something horrible? You've asked God's forgiveness. You know technically you're forgiven, but you just don't feel it. Okay, again, this psalm's for you. Because David is going to talk about how thoroughly God has cleansed him as he cries out to the Lord and the kind of forgiveness that God gives so here he goes, have mercy upon me, O God. And you'll see these adjectives all through here of David, again, speaking of God in the, in the most glowing terms, adjective-wise, descriptive-wise that he can, just reminding himself and appealing to God because of God's greatness, God's mercy. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, not just your mercies, your tender mercies. God, I'm totally broken. I'm pouring everything out there. Have mercy. I'm, I'm coming to you, not on the basis that I should be forgiven. I shouldn't be forgiven. I'm not coming on the basis of anything other than you are this good. You are this merciful. You are this forgiving. And because you are, I'm going to remind you of it. And I'm going to remind myself of it. And I'm going to cry out for your forgiveness. He says, blot out my transgressions. Again, transgressions for the most part in the Old Testament. There are some variations of the words from time to time by the translators. But the majority of the time, of the time you see transgressions, it means willful sin. Not sin that I just messed up on, but I chose to do it. I knew I wasn't supposed to do it, and I chose to do it. It's like the kid, you know, it's like, don't touch that. And they've got their little finger, don't touch that. I said, don't touch that. And then they do it, right? That's what transgression is. It's where God is speaking to us saying, Mark, 
don't do that. And he sees that little sinful finger keep moving toward, what, what, Lord? Don't, Mark, what, what, Lord? That's what David said. That's what I did. And God, I know you, you know that I know that. We both know it. I could have turned away from looking at Bathsheba. I wouldn't have gotten in this mess. I wouldn't have killed her husband. And you were telling me the whole time, turn away, David, stop it. Don't do this. I did it anyway. Blot out my transgression, the willful thing that I did against you. Blot it out. Wash me thoroughly. And notice again his completeness here. I need to be completely inside and out rinsed. And we'll, we'll see this more as we go through this psalm. But thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I don't want anything remaining on me. I don't want any vestige of, of my past sin on me. For, and notice this, and this is the key here to repentance. This is the key here to forgiveness. And that is acknowledging our sin to God. We, we, we must acknowledge it. God will not accept us unless we acknowledge our sin. It is a humility issue. He says, I acknowledge my transgressions, that I'm acknowledging that I did this on purpose. And my sin is always before me. You know, David couldn't escape it. It was always there for a year. It took David a year to repent. And that whole year, David is just being tormented because he knows that he needs to repent. He's just refusing to do it. You know what that's like. We know we're guilty. We're refusing to repent until God finally breaks us and God finally broke David. And then David is saying, again, you know, you knew this was happening. You knew, but it was always before me. I couldn't escape it. And look at this. To emphasize how bad his sin was, against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Now, was, was God the only one that David sinned against? Not at all. David sinned against Bathsheba. David sinned against Uriah. David sinned against the nation. So David is not denying his sin here as far as what he's done to others. What David is saying is, in comparison to everyone else, it is you, Lord, that I've hurt the most. It is you that I've sinned against the most. And it is that understanding that when we sin, although we hurt other people, and I'm not taking away from the damage we do and acknowledging that damage we do to, we do to other people, but it's God that we need to be the most concerned about. It's like with Joseph, when Potiphar's wife was coming on to him and Joseph ran. And before Joseph ran, he said to her, he said, look, I, I, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You know, he, he obviously acknowledged against Potiphar and, and, and everyone else that would be affected. But David's heart was God comes first, or rather Joseph's heart was God comes first. And David's heart here is the same thing. God comes before all of this. And so he's the one that I've hurt the most. He's the one that really I've, I have really just, you know, sinned against and, and done this evil. And he says, why did this happen? That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. In other words, I'm confessing right now so that it won't look like you did something wrong or that, that, that I was in any way justified. What I did was wrong. It was just wrong. And this really, to me, is what I've seen over the years for those and, and, and that I've seen that fall in sin. The difference in those that end up getting back on track with God and those that kind of just disappear is they're the ones that acknowledge that they're wrong, that they sinned, and they confess it to God. And I watch God restore them. And yes, it's humbling. And yes, it's, it's sad and, and all this kind of stuff as far as heartbreaking to watch it happen. But these are the ones that I see being restored to the Lord. I, I've seen some people that... You know, they act self-righteous. Like, that wasn't that bad, no big deal. And you see them years later, they're gone. They're nowhere near anything to do with God. And I can think of one individual many years ago. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't anybody like that. But I think of an individual that we were counseling that was just in, had been caught in just this terrible sin that had been going on for quite some time. And I remember thinking, this guy's never gonna repent. There, honestly, you think there's no hope for this guy. I mean, have you ever seen somebody that the pride is so great that it, it just kind of emanates off? It kind of radiates. The pride radiates. It's almost like a glow, a glow of pride is the only way I know how to describe it. There's, a, there's something about pride that if somebody's so full of it, their head's kind of up and there's this almost a glow of, of this grossness, right? That was this person. And I remember thinking, there's not a chance. This guy's done for. He's too full of himself. He's never gonna, this guy today is on fire for Christ. So I had to eat my words and learn a big lesson because you know what he did? He chose to humble himself and confess his sin and lay his pride down. And when you do that, God will meet you with grace from heaven and God will restore you. It's humility. It's beautiful. And so David is doing that. He's not gonna play any games. I'm the king. I can do it all. By the way, all the other kings and all the other nations around, they were regularly killing people and committing adultery. That was the norm in that day. That was happening in Syria, all over. The kings just did that. I'm the king, I can do what I want. I'll take your wife, I'll take your wife. I'll sleep with this person, I'll do whatever. I'll kill them, I'll go kill that guy, I don't like him. 
Look at the difference in a man of God and how everyone else was living normally in their world. See, we, we can't base how we respond to the way the world does things. Well, everybody else in the world is watching that. Everybody else in the world is doing that. Everybody else in the world says that. Everybody else does whatever. It doesn't matter. What has God called us to do? As his kids, what are we called to do? We're called to live in holiness and in righteousness before God. And so David says, he's just laying it out there. David's broken. He knows he's accountable to God. He knows that, that God is, is clean and he's the one guilty and God will be found blameless when he judges. And look at this verse five. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Now David's not saying that my mother committed sin like had adultery or uh, you know, relations outside of marriage or something like that and, and got pregnant. That's not what he's saying. You know, David's family was a righteous family. They did, there was nothing like that historically. What David is saying is, I was born a sinner. I was born in iniquity. He's confessing to God. I, I acknowledge that I was just born a sinner. Sinner comes, sinning comes natural for me. And again, this is where we see another place in the Bible. We see the sin nature of mankind. This is where the world misses it. By the way, frankly, this is where psychology misses it. I'm not saying there's not some things that can be gleaned from psychology. I'm not saying that. But for the most part, psychology's foundation starts on a, on a wrong platform. And it, the platform is, is that basically everyone is good and it depends on your environment and the influences how you turn out to be. The Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says everybody's born bad. And it's only by the grace of God that any good ever happens. And David is acknowledging that. David is saying right here, I was born a sinner. I was born in iniquity like we all are. We're born sinners, separated from God. In, in sin, my mother conceived me. So I, I came out a sinner. Again, how many, how many of you guys have had to teach your kids to, to do wrong? It comes natural, doesn't it? You know? He says, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you'll make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Interesting, the, the meaning of the word purge here. Purge means literally to knead or to mash. You ever seen somebody kneading dough, you know, or, or mashing? It reminds me of the, the you see the, the, the women by the river, you know, and they've got the laundry and they're doing it and they're mashing it on this board, you know, and, and, and doing this kind of thing. That's what that word means. Now what David is saying is, no pun intended, I need you to mash me like this and, and just, I mean, Cleanse me. Squeeze every drop of dirt out of this human cloth that's before you, God. I need you to just purge me and just force it out of me. Do whatever you have to do to get rid of it. And notice what he says to use. Use hyssop. Again, that should ring some bells, not just because hyssop is what was lifted up to the Lord on the cross uh, as they lifted up his drink to him, but hyssop was what they used, the priests would use when they were taking care of sin. They would sacrifice the animal. They would dip the hyssop branch. It, it's these leaves that has little hairs on it. They would dip it in the blood. It would hold the blood, and they would sprinkle the blood on, on the altar and on the people and whatever else needed to be cleansed. And then after they would use that, they'd also sprinkle water. And it was this whole picture of being washed clean, cleansed by the blood of forgiveness, cleansed now by the water, uh, being washed clean, and being cleansed by the Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of symbols and pictures here. And what David is saying is, this means there needs to be a sacrifice. I recognize blood must be shed for what I've done. And since you're not making me shed my blood, Lord, cleanse me with hyssop. Let blood be shed. Again, the sacrifice before God, which now we know is through Christ. But this sacrifice being purged and cleansed by the blood, even when we sin, we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You go and say, Lord, forgive me based on your blood on the cross. Wash me clean. And you're purged. And then God, wash me clean by your word. Wash me clean by the water from heaven, by your Holy Spirit. Wash me with hyssop. And some of us need to pray that maybe tonight, that I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Again, no stain whatsoever remains. Make me hear joy and gladness. Again, during this dark time of David not confessing his sin and denying his sin, there was this darkness. You know, the joy and gladness was gone. And he says, I want that back. Give me joy and gladness again. Restore me in the joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. If you've ever had a broken bone, you realize that's not a time of rejoicing. He says, but Lord, heal the bones that you've broken spiritually that I might rejoice again that you broke because you were breaking me because I'm a broken man now. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So don't look any longer on it, Lord. And again, one of the most famous verses, again, of all the Bible. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is a powerful verse. 
Now, some of you guys are into cars. Maybe some of you girls are. Or, or, or maybe it's even some other topic. Fix it up. You watch one of those, you know, TV shows and you want to buy an old house and restore it. That's a great thing. So you get it and you paint it and fix it and do all this new stuff to it. And if guys work on cars, you know, you sand them down, you bond to them, you paint them, you do all the things, you get the engine, you know, and you're whatever nostalgic and you try to find all the parts and restore it. A great hobby, right? And so you take the old thing and you work on it to, to, to make it like new as it was and try to restore it the best you can. God does that. God will do that in our lives. He will take our heart and he will work on our heart and he'll restore it if we've sinned. He'll, he'll, he'll make something that we've messed up, you know, renewed and refreshed. And so there's nothing wrong in that prayer. We see that um, really played out in scripture symbolically where God works on the heart and does this. And it's spoken of by the writers of the Bible and the spirit of God. But this right here is so special to me. And this shows you where David was in his heart and what David cries out. And some of you may want to cry out tonight and what I've cried out for God to do for me. Because when David cries out here to the Lord, what the word here, when it says, creating me a clean heart, it's the word bara. Now that may ring some bells for some of you who have studied the very first verse of the Bible in the original. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me put it another way. In the beginning, God barred the heaven and the earth. It literally means making something from Nothing. Now, what's my point here? Why would David choose that word? What David's saying is, there's no home fix-up for my heart. The house has to be torn down. You can't bondo this thing. You can't work on the engine. It's ruined. There's no hope for it. It's done. So, Lord, here's what I'm asking. Would you just give me a brand new one? Don't fix my old one. It's not worth working on. Take a brand new one and put it inside of me. I've been praying this last couple of weeks, just reading this. God, I don't want, I don't mind you working on my heart. That's great, but I'd rather have a brand new one. Now, I am, I'm, people are different as far as what they like. A lot of people like to take the nostalgic things and fix them up. I'm one of those people, I like new things, you know? And so for me, this was an easy prayer to pray. Just give me a brand new one, Lord. I don't have to worry about, you know, any leaks or whether or not that's gonna work or not work or what has to be repaired or how long. It just works. And David said, God, I, I, my heart is so bad and so unrepairable. I'm asking you to start over. Don't even try to work with it. Just give me a new one from nothing. And then secondly, Lord, here's what I want you to do. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Steadfast means one, one that'll now maintain. You gave me a heart. I went after adultery and I went after murder. You sing this song, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And I remember a few years back, we're singing that song and somebody got really upset. That's unbiblical. You can't sing that. No, I beg to differ. It's very biblical because the Holy Spirit works in different ways in our lives. There's three ways the Holy Spirit works in our life. He's in us at salvation. It's the word E-N in the New Testament. It means indwelling. He is with us. It's the word para, P-A-R-A in the New Testament. That means he comes alongside to help us and guide us. These are the works of the Holy Spirit, the three major works of the Spirit. And the last one is he comes upon us. And the upon work of the Holy Spirit is where you see God's power come into our life or someone else's life. Whenever there was a war to happen, the, you know, the, the, the God would come upon David and he would go fight the enemy. Or when a prophet was about to prophesy in the name of the Lord, it would say, and you'll see this as you look through the scripture, the spirit came upon him and he began to prophesy because it's a different work. It's not the indwelling. It's not the salvation issue. It's not par. It's not alongside encouraging. It is a power that comes upon us. It is the upon. Jesus said this, the remain in Jerusalem until the spirit of God has come Upon you, it's that same word. EPI is the word there in the language, and it means a power that you're going to need that comes from the outside. It has nothing to do with salvation. It has nothing to do with God encouraging you and helping you. It is simply for power. That's its only purpose. And so, what David here is saying is, you got to remember, in the Old Testament, they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, think about that. There was no indwelling. Nobody had the Holy Spirit indwelling them in the Old Testament. Why? Available to mankind until Jesus Christ died on the cross because God's Holy Spirit could not live permanently inside of sinful beings. So Jesus had to pay for our sins. Now, although we're still sinful, his spirit moves inside and he can take up dwelling and we have the indwelling or the salvation experience and now the Holy Spirit is in us. But that's very different from the Holy Spirit being upon us. So when Samuel anointed David, if you go back and look in 1 Samuel, when it doesn't say, and the spirit came within David, 
It doesn't say, and the Spirit was alongside David. It says, and one David from that day forward. What's my point? David is saying, look, I know you've forgiven me. I know I'm going to heaven, but I don't want to lose your power in my life. I don't want to be that it just grieved your spirit away. I want you to come upon me and refresh me. Now, maybe some of you have done something to grieve God's spirit away tonight. You said, I've grieved God's spirit away. I don't, it's not just about feeling it. Sometimes we feel God, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's because of sin, sometimes it's not. God will have to show each of us that in, in whatever he's dealing with us on. But the point is, if we've done something where we grieved God's spirit and we haven't made it right with God, there's not gonna be that fresh power back in our life or being used to any degree until we confess. And so David is coming before the Lord saying, rub me on that wash basin, you know, scrub me, c- cover me with blood from sacrifice. I confess everything. I'm not hiding anything. I want to, don't, don't, don't heal my heart. It's unhealable. Give me a brand new one. Create something from nothing and put it inside of me. Start over. And uh, again, make it steadfast and don't take it from me. Let me be used again. He's going to follow that theme of being used again. Uh, Notice he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors, that is other people that willfully sin, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. If you'll keep working by your spirit through me, I'll reach out to other people that have done the same thing I've done. I'll tell you, there's something about our own sin that gives us grace for everybody else around us. This is not a good advantage, so don't take this wrong, but I had the good advantage of being a horrific sinner before I came to Christ. There's nothing good about sin. But I was so sinful and so dark and all the drugs and alcohol and all the mess that I was in that when God forgave me, it was not only joy and unbelievable that God would, number one, that he saved me, much less use me, but when somebody comes up to me and goes, I don't know that I can even tell you what I've done, I'm like... Try me. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not belittling it, but, and they start telling things that are no worse than what I've already done. I'm like, God will forgive you. And, and I don't just say it as a cheerleader to encourage them all, come on, you know, God will work. I lived it. God forgave me. He washed me with hyssop by the blood of his son on the cross. He purified me. He not only indwells me, he came upon me and gave me power for ministry. And I don't want to lose that either. Even as David said, don't take that away from me. I don't want to lose that either. But I can say to somebody else, God will do the same thing for you. He'll forgive you. He'll set you free. And David would say to somebody, well, yeah, but I I sinned again and I grieved his spirit away. Well, then you need to ask his forgiveness and confess it and ask him to restore it to you because he will restore it. But you don't know how black my heart is. Ask for a new one. He makes them. That's what he does. I love it. Just, again, the Lord is so good. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. Now he's talking about Uriah, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not despise, rather you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. It's not so much that you want more animals. David no doubt was making animal sacrifice during that year that he hadn't repented. But the animal sacrifice meant nothing because he hadn't repented yet. So it didn't do anything before God. Modern day application, it would be like we're living in sin and we show up to sing praise at the worship time. God's not going to hear that. I said, I'm not going to hear that until you get right. You're just singing, but you're not singing to me because if you really want to be right with me, you'll repent of your sin and then we can have fellowship together. So don't, your sacrifice isn't doing any good. Your sacrifice of praise is not reaching heaven. Your prayers are not affecting anything. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. If you want that relationship, you have to repent. You have to confess like David did. You have to repent. I have to repent. That's how that works. And so sacrifices of God are a broken Spirit. That means we're being humble before God. We're being truthful before God. We're confessing before God. We're not hiding anything before God. We're being real before God. And he says, a broken and contrite heart. That means a humble heart filled with pride. He says, these, O God, you will not despise. If any of us come to God that way, God has mercy and God has grace. And it's the hardest thing to do because it takes humility. But he says, I'll, God will do this if you come to him that way. This is what God wants and it's what God wants from us tonight. He says, do good in your pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then 
You shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. Bring a whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Notice the order here. Burnt offering, and then he goes from burnt offering to whole burnt offering. And then he says, when you do that, then bulls will be offered. What's this talking about? The burnt offering is when you put the whole animal on there and every bit of it. Went. And some of the offerings, you would take part of the animal and you'd burn it unto God and you'd keep part of it for yourself. And you'd actually eat part of the sacrifice and it represented you and God eating together, fellowship, becoming one with each other. And there was this shared thing going on in the sacrifice. But there was one sacrifice called the burnt offering that you didn't eat any of it. Every bit of the animal that you brought, it's on the altar and it's completely burned up to God. And it was symbolic of you saying, basically, God, I'm giving everything to you. I'm holding nothing back. I am yours to completely consume. And so he says, burnt offering. Then he says, whole burnt offering. I'm giving all of me to you completely. And he says, when you do that, look at this. He says, that's when they shall offer bulls on the altar. What does that mean? Bulls were the most expensive offering. They were a huge animal. To offer a bull cost the person a lot of money. Imagine taking one of your cattle today. One of your, if, you, if you raise cattle or you've ever bought, you know, maybe you went in and bought a cow with somebody, you know, for meat for the freezer or the winter or whatever, you know how much the cattle can cost. You, you buy an animal. He's saying, you're taking that animal and you're going and you're sacrificing all of the giant oxen. And you bring it to them, they sacrifice it. And how they even got it up on the altar, I don't know. Number of priests, I don't know the process to get the animal up there. They cut it in pieces is how they would do it. So no doubt just cutting it up in pieces. They wouldn't drag the whole animal up there, no doubt. But either way, they put it up there on the altar and burn the whole thing. He's saying every bit of it is yours, the most expensive offering. When we truly give ourselves to the Lord, we give God the most expensive offering. And I'm not talking finances. It's us. Lord, I'm yours. What do you want to do with me? I'm completely yours. Consume me for your glory. Psalm 51, a beautiful psalm of, of David. Now we get into another psalm of David in Psalm 52. Notice the introduction of David. When Doeg the Edomite went and told Saul and said to him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Now a little bit of background here to know what's going on. David had just, um, Saul had turned on David. Saul had turned his heart against David. And remember, David went on the run for about 10 years, running from Saul out in the wilderness. And so when this was beginning to happen, Saul was trying to kill David. And David knew, you know what? Saul's going to kill me if I don't get out of here. This is a done deal. David takes off with his faithful men, a few of his faithful men, not that many. He goes to the city of Nob, which is where the priests were all there. That's on if you're facing the, if you're on the Temple Mount and you're facing the Mount of Olives, if you can see that in your mind, usually you see the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. Maybe we'll do it that way. You see all the pictures there of, of, of the Dome of the Rock. Imagine you're on the Mount of Olives looking at the Dome of the Rock. Nob was over to the right. All you do is move over to the right on the Mount of Olives, a good ways down through there, and there was Nob. You saw a great view of the Temple Mount from there, but that was Nob. That's where the priests lived. So the priests would be up there, and there were their families, their kids, everybody was there in that town, and that's where they had the the sword of Goliath. And so David fled to the priest there at Nob and he goes to them trying to find some food. They would have had some leftover bread there that they would put on the show bread, that, which was in the tabernacle on a regular basis. And so he goes to the priest and goes, hey, have you got anything to eat? And have you got a weapon? Because uh, Saul sent us on a mission, right? And so he lies to the, the priest, but he's running for his life from Saul. And he goes, yeah, we have some bread here. It's, it's the show bread. We've already brought it out of the holy place. As long as the men are purified and un, you know, not Levitically uh, defiled, you can take the bread. He says, do you have a weapon? Well, yeah. He said, we got the, the sword of Goliath. He said, there's not one like it. Let me have it. You know, that's the one that, that I took away from Goliath when I killed him. You know, cut his head off with it. So I'll take it. Well, there was a guy by the name of Doeg that was there. And Doeg was faithful to Saul and he was a wicked man. And so he had no way to know whether or not David was telling the truth or not. He couldn't, you know, get on the cell phone and call him there and say, hey, uh, David's up here saying this or whatever. You know, that it, he literally had to wait till he could travel back down and talk to Saul and then come back. By then, David would be long gone. So no doubt he's there watching David. David probably saw Doeg keeping an eye on him, what's going on. David leaves. And we don't know how long it is after the whole episode here with Doeg before he did this. But Saul's sitting under a terebinth tree. I believe it was a terebinth tree. He's sitting there with his men and he's pouting. And he's basically saying, you know, nobody loves me. You know, all you people are being, David's run from me and, and nobody's telling me where David is and nobody's helped me kill David. And if you guys really love me, if you really cared about me helping you. And Doeg, wanting the cash, which we'll see as we get a little further here in Psalm 52, he says, hey, I saw David. Really? Yeah. What happened? He was up there with the priests and the priests, they not only fed him when he was running from you, Saul, they gave him a weapon. What? Yep. 
That's what they did. Now, how evil is that? Because Doeg knew the priest had no idea. David was a faithful servant of Saul. So for David to go to them and say, hey, Saul sent me on a mission, they would have naturally believed him. But this Doeg was so wicked, he presented it like somehow they were in cahoots with David. And of course, the rage that Saul had bought into it. And so Saul goes up to Nob, kills them all. Kills all the priests, kills their wives, kills their children, kills the nursing babies, kills them all because of this lie of Doeg. David hears about it because one guy escaped. There's one that got away. He escaped down to David and said, you know what? They've just killed um, everyone, uh, all my family and, and all the priests. And all, you know, when you guys came up here, they gave you bread and the sword. They just killed everybody in my family. And David said, they've killed them all because I was there. He said, stay with me and you'll be safe. I'll protect you. And David knew this wicked Doeg had done this. And so now David writes this psalm. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? I think this was a, I think there's a, a hint of sarcasm here. I don't think he was really thinking that Doeg was a mighty man. A mighty man is not going to kill women and children. I think he's making a point. You're, you're not mighty at all. You're the worst. You're the scum of the earth. But this kind of sarcastic, why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. In other words, you're not going to outdo God in his goodness and his faithfulness. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good. Lying rather than speaking righteousness. So you deceived Saul and he killed all the priests. Selah. And so this kind of a meditation. And again, this wasn't just David kind of writing this to get the guy back. Remember, these Psalms were written as a meditation to learn from and to grow from. So David is basically giving an example here saying, look what this guy did. Don't be like that. Don't present things in a false way that can harm others. Meditate on that. You know, there's ways that you can present something and there's ways you can present something. If there's somebody that you don't like and they do something that you know was innocent, but it, was, it ended up being bad or whatever, you can present it to somebody else in a way that makes it look like they really meant to do it, can't you? I can. We have to be careful how we present things, you know? So-and-so said this, and they said that. Well, you're not telling why they said it. You're not giving an understanding of why they said it. You know, And so that's what he did. He goes, it's evil. Meditate on that. Don't do that. You love all devouring words, you deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of your dwelling place. So he, he begins to speak now about the future judgment that's going to come upon Doeg because of what he's done. He says, and he will uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. Think about that. So number one, your sin... And what you've done, there's a meditation. We need to be warned about that. Now, here's another warning. There's going to be a judgment day. You know, we see a lot of things on TV today. We hear a lot of people doing things. We see a lot of things happening around in our nation and around the globe. You see it, and it gets you angry, right? It gets you upset. And, and, and some things we should be upset about. It's very upsetting. But don't forget, there is a judgment day. And when that person stands before God, it's going to be a lot worse than it is anything that could happen to them now. And so we need to have a heart of mercy and say, God, I, I pray they'd repent. I pray they'd see their sin and their error because it's only going to get worse. And he says, that's what's going to happen to you, Doeg. Meditate on that. The righteous also shall, shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, here's the man who did not make God his strength. And as you betrayed David, you betrayed everyone, you lied. Here's what happens when you do that. But he trusted in the abundance of his riches. Note that. And strengthened himself in wickedness. In other words, what it reveals here is, is that it appears the heart behind Doeg exposing this was, hey, what's in it for me? See, Saul had just said, who else is going to give you lands? Who else is going to help you financially? David's not going to do that. And Doeg goes, oh, lands, finances. Oh, yeah, hey, I saw what happened up there. Really? Yeah, here's what happened. So it's for the money. Those who do wicked things for the buck today. How scary is that going to be on Judgment Day? Think about that. Basically, what he did was he took money so that others could be put to death. I think about Planned Parenthood, others that would do things like that. You may drive a nice car today, you may have a great home for the blood of other babies. Man, I wouldn't trade places with you. I'd rather tree for it. Olive tree green, number one, shows he's healthy and he's strong. Also, olive of the Holy Spirit. 
He's, it's like, like fresh oil through me, like in the house of God, ministering, whereas you're going to be facing judgment one day. I'm being used by God in great ways. And that really is the hope we have as the believer. You see people that seem to be getting away with their wickedness, and yet here you are in the house of God, being filled with God's spirit, hearing God's word, and ministering to others as you mingle back and forth and pray for each other and encourage each other. So you're like green olive trees. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you've done it. And because in the presence of your saints, or rather, and in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. So again, a, a, a short, short psalm, but a beautiful psalm. Another short psalm here, 53, very short. Talks about the folly of godlessness. Look at this. To the chief musician set to Mahaloth, a contemplation of David, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Pretty strong statement against atheism, isn't it? You know, the Bible says that everyone believes in God at some point. You have to convince yourself that he's not there, which means that even the atheists, if they've convinced themselves at this point, many of them, I think, still believe in God. At some point, they did believe in God because God puts it in every man's heart, Ecclesiastes says. So they're not being truthful about that. But notice here what he says about them. He says they're a fool. Now, God didn't call many people a fool in the Bible. But he says the atheist is a fool. Now, why would God say the atheist is a fool? Think what you have to do to believe in atheism. You have to look at the design of the heavens and all the gravitational fields and rotations and think that just happened by chance. You've got to look at the earth and see the creation of the trees and the way that the winds circulate on the earth and the waters evaporate and, and rewater and the way the animals, you know, function and, and, and the planet. You've got to look at that and say, that just happened by chance. You've got to look at mankind and see how our bodies work and how our eyes work and our minds work and look at the DNA that we now know from science and the genetic code that has a data system to it, a, 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 a very scientific, organized system. You've got to look at that and say, just happened. And when you think about it that way, you realize you'd have to be a fool to believe that. And so God's not name calling. He's stating through David a very factual truth. No one but a fool could believe this just happened. And so the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. They are corrupt and they've done abominable iniquity. There's none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there is any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who, do, who does good. No, not one. Now, David is not saying that none of us ever do anything good. That's not his point. Some of you may have done something very good today for someone else. His point is man by his nature is evil. Our, our sin nature, which David covered earlier, if we do what is natural to us, no one naturally is going to do good. No one naturally is going to do what's right. We may respond to the conscience that God gave us, but it's God's conscience that we're responding to. And so he's saying that's what mankind is like before God. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge? who eat up my people as they eat bread and they do not call upon God. It's as if God's speaking through the psalmist here saying, it's just like a, a casual meal for them and they just destroy the righteous. They have no sense of care that they're gonna be judged one day for that. And there's no sense of love here in their heart without God. They're in great fear where no fear was. You know, again, God allows the heart to become fearful in the wicked. He says, for God has scattered the bones of him who encamps against you. You have put them to shame because God has despised them. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when God brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. A lot of times in the Psalms, you'll see it kind of end with this kind of just burst of rejoicing about, hey, God, restore, bring back your people. Come. In other words, we say today, come quickly, Lord, just come back and restore. And so David finishes that. One more short Psalm, Psalm 54, and we'll end with this tonight. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, is David not hiding with us? Now, we talked about David on the run from Saul. There were two times that David was betrayed by the Ziphites. Now, the Ziphites were from the tribe of Judah. They were Jews. They were from the same, you know, from Abraham, same family, right? And yet they betrayed David. Why? Because they were showing their allegiance to Saul, maybe because they were afraid of Saul, whatever the case might be. And this is probably speaking about the first time that David ran into the Ziphites, where he actually went to rescue them. Now note this, David went to rescue the Ziphites from their enemies, and then the Ziphites turned him in to his, to his enemies. It's showing the heart of man again. You ever done something nice for someone and they turn around and attack you right afterwards? 
What he's saying is, this is what David dealt with with the Ziphites. He showed kindness, and they turned on him. He says, save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, and give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen up against me, that is the Ziphites, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them, say la. It's because they're not walking in the spirit and they don't see that God is working through me in helping them, they're turning on me. Behold, God is my helper. He says, I'm not gonna worry about what men do. God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. And so David, again, you know, crying out to God to bring justice here, which he often does in the Psalms. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. And again, if you read the story, you'll see that God did deliver him out of that situation. God rescued him from uh, Saul. And as they came after him, when the Ziphites turned him in, and he says, God, you've been my hero. You're the one that watches that. Though man may betray me, you will be faithful. What a great way to end tonight for us. Though man may betray us, God will be faithful. Next week, we're going to see David get into the betrayal of Ahithophel, a very close companion. There's going to be a whole picture there of Judas and what happened with Jesus and all this. And we'll talk about that when we get there. But as we end tonight, I'd like to do something. I'd like to ask the worship team to come on up here and kind of maybe surprise them as well. You can do one of the slow songs you've already done. You don't have to worry about coming up with something new. I know you've got a song planned for the end, but I'd like to do one song, just kind of a contemplative, maybe one of the ones you guys have already done before you do the last song. And for those of you that want to just cry out to God tonight and say, God created me a clean heart. Bara, something from nothing. I just want a fresh, brand new start. I want to give you an opportunity right now to get to have that moment with the Lord to just cry out for God's forgiveness, to cry out for God to give you the heart that you need. And again, by you responding, again, it doesn't mean that you're in the middle of some big sin, so nobody's gonna be judging you if you respond to that. But I do know that when you're crying out for God to do a restoration, sometimes it's healthy to kind of give you an avenue to express that. So here's what I wanna do. You can sit right there, you can pray. If you wanna come down here at the altar and just pray here, you can stand and pray, you can kneel and pray. Again, it's, it's, it's not super comfortable. We don't have a lot of the kneeling areas here for that on the concrete floor, but I just want to have a song of just kind of worshiping the Lord. And if you want to just say, God, I need you to create in me a clean heart. I need you to, to scrub me. I need your hyssop. I need to start fresh. I need something new. You may need that physical expression of getting up and coming down here to help set you free in that. You're free to do that. Nobody's judging you, not even making opinions of what it could be or what's happening, just you and God. And if you want to sit there where you are and do the same thing, do it right there where you sit. But I want to make sure that's available. So after we do a song just of contemplation, we've got 10 minutes left. There's plenty of time for two songs. Then you guys can finish with that last song. But let's just, let's just give God an opportunity to do that. Let's worship the Lord. And Father, I do pray that you would now, again, create in us a clean heart, a new heart. Or some of us say, we don't, don't even want you to try to repair the one that I've got. Just give me a brand new one. The, the old one isn't even repairable. So create a new one from nothing. Start over. And give me a steadfast spirit that can maintain until the day I'm in the kingdom. Father, thank you for the work of your spirit tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name.